If you know someone who loves ancient mysteries, ask them to name the top three most mysterious objects from ancient Egypt. They will most likely name the Giza pyramids, the Aswan obelisk, and the fantastic sarcophagi of the Serapeum. Wait, sarcophagi or mysterious artifacts left by an ancient civilization of gods? We are in Saqqara, some 7 kilometers outside Cairo, just a stone throw away from King Joseph's famous step pyramid. This is the home to a maze of subterranean galleries cut in limestone rock. Having paid 150 Egyptian pounds for the ticket, tourists flock inside the galleries, only to stare in awe at the giant stone sarcophagi. This mysterious place is called the Serapeum. It's in Saqqara, Egypt. It was discovered in 1850 by French Egyptologist Auguste Mariette. Our team has recently paid a visit to the Serapeum. Where does the name Serapeum come from? The ancient Egyptians worshipped the sacred bull Apis, whom they believed to be the live incarnation of the goddess Cyrus. Historians believe that the names Osiris and Apis were combined to make the name Serapis. The cult of Serapis became common after Egypt had been conquered by Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC. The name Serapium simply means the Temple of Serapis. The earliest burials of sacred bulls were found in Saqqara. They date back to the 18th dynasty and are over 3,300 years old. The earliest subterranean galleries for Apis mummies were cut during the 19th dynasty. Thus, the Serapium was created. Egyptologists believe that the giant sarcophagi were used for the interment of the sacred bulls. But how did the Egyptians select an Apis bull? The priests would go all around Egypt looking for young calves with special markings on them. Eventually, they would identify a chosen black bull with a light triangle on his head. The bull was then brought to Memphis with great ceremony, where he was kept in the temple in the care of the priests. The bull was used as an oracle, while its breath was believed to cure diseases. Would you have a sacred bull breathe on you? Please don't hesitate to share in the comments. When Apis died, he was buried with great pomp in the royal style in the catacombs of the Serapeum. After that, the priests would set off to look for the next sacred bull. This is what Egyptologists believe, but not everyone is happy with their theory. Sacred bulls? <laughs> Only an imbecile can believe this rubbish. So much hard labor, and for what? To bury some beef? Whoever dug those catacombs did not intend them as a cattle mortuary. How do we even know that these stone boxes were used for bull burials? When Mariette had excavated the Serapeum, he found the sarcophagi to be empty. So who made them and how? How were those monstrous boxes transported down the narrow subterranean corridors? This is what people write to us in the comments. This selection of YouTube videos on the Serapeum speaks for itself. You can see with the naked eye that both the entrance and the corridor are more narrow than any of the sarcophagi. Each one of them weighed between 70 to 100 tons. I do not believe that the dynastic Egyptians possessed this technology. The presence of a bull and the number of the boxes are serious evidence to confirm the ancient Zoroastrian legends. Christopher Dunn got in and measured all these interior angles. They're extremely precise. Independent researcher Christopher Dunn believes that the Serapium stone boxes were made with cutting-edge technology that has only recently been reinvented by our civilization. 
He thoroughly researched the mysterious sarcophagi and concluded that not only could they not have been manually transported to their current location, but they could not have been created by hand in the first place. Ufologist Eric von Däniken writes in his book The Eyes of the Sphinx that the Serapium sarcophagi were used to inter monsters or genetically modified hybrid creatures bred by aliens. Alternate historians agree that the Serapium sarcophagi were made by an unknown culture for unknown purposes, possibly tens of thousands of years ago, while the ancient Egyptians later reused the heritage of a long-gone ancient civilization. All right, let's investigate. In this video, I'm gonna tell you what science actually does know about the Serapium, and I will explain why the antediluvian sarcophagi creators are no more real than the Stargate movie. Give my regards to King Todd, asshole. So what did archaeologists actually discover in the catacombs of Saqqara? Let's turn to the writings by August Mariette and later archaeologists. Many of Mariette's manuscripts perished during a flooding in the Cairo Museum. Luckily, we still have his work titled The Serapium of Memphis, written in 1857. After the French archaeologist passed away in 1881, a more detailed account of his excavations was published. When Mariette arrived in Saqqara, he spotted a sphinx head sticking out of the desert sand. He knew that the ancient Greek geographer Strabo mentioned an alley of sphinxes leading up to the Serapium, which was already buried in sand in the 1st century BC. Mariette started the excavation. He ended up finding not only the catacombs filled with the sarcophagi, but also the ruins of a massive complex consisting of temples, shrines and other buildings, as well as lots of statues, including the large statue of the Apis bull. Life was not a bed of roses for 19th century archaeologists. Digging hard in the heat and dust, illuminated only by the dim light of candles. No aircon, no chilled coke. But the brave and resilient scientist was lucky. Mariette managed to put together a basic chronology of the Serapium construction. His work was then taken over by other Egyptologists. So what is the current dating of the catacombs and sarcophagi of the Serapium? A popular opinion says that there are almost no inscriptions inside the Serapium, except for a few short texts on four of the sarcophagi. This isn't actually true. By the early 19th century, the catacombs had been thoroughly robbed and stripped of their valuables. Luckily, the grave robbers did leave something behind. Inside the catacombs, Mariette discovered lots of stele covered with inscriptions. The stele once decorated the walls of the subterranean corridors. You can still clearly see the niches that once housed the stele at the entrance to the galleries. Mariette writes that he had collected 120 of those stele. The total number of the stele found would eventually reach over 1,000. The majority was shipped to France and is now in possession of the Louvre Museum. What are these stele and what is written on them? Some stele were official. In ancient times, they were embedded in the walls separating the chambers with the sarcophagi from the central gallery. You were not allowed inside the burial chambers to marvel at the giant sarcophagi, as all burial chambers were walled up. All you could do was read an inscription on the official stele placed at the chamber to learn who was interred inside. The stele said that the sacred bull Apis was born in a regnal year of a certain king, installed on the throne in the temple in Memphis, died in a certain year and was buried in the Serapium on a certain date. The sacred bull's total regnal time came to a certain number of years, months and days. Here is a stele. It's now part of the Louvre collection. It says, quote, In the 52nd year of King Ptolemy VIII Eurigetes, 119 BC, the great god Apis Osiris was brought to the tomb and placed inside a black stone sarcophagus after all rituals had been performed on him in the sacred place. End of quote. Thanks to these inscriptions, we can not only learn the chronology of the sacred bull's cult, but also get valuable information on Egyptian chronology in general, based on the king's regnal years. The majority of the stele, however, are private. They were placed in the catacombs by pious visitors. This is similar to the faithful of today lighting candles in the church or leaving little papers with pleas. In Pharaonic Egypt, a noble believer would place a stone stele in the catacombs. The stele would bear an inscription with a prayer to Apis Osiris, the believer's name and occupation, their ancestors' names, the date of the visit, and in some cases, even the jobs they had done at the necropolis. 
One of these stele informs us that on a certain day and month in year 18 of the rule of Ptolemy X, Sanek, the son of Parketa, and Iseturet oversaw the transportation of an apis sarcophagus from Memphis to the tomb complex in Saqqara. The job took 19 days to complete, of which five days were off. In other words, moving the sarcophagus by a mere 8 kilometers took as long as two weeks. All the stele speak of the commencement of work on the burial chambers, the enlargement of the catacombs, works in the Temple of Apis in Memphis, and so on. Some of the stele contain interesting details of the Apis burial ceremony. One text speaks on behalf of a prince, the son of King Amasis II. Quote, During the time of Apis's ascension to the heaven, I abstained from bread and water for four days. I took off my garments. I stayed among those in need, mourning and lamenting. For seventy days no food, but bread, water and vegetables came into my stomach, until the great god rested in his great place in the necropolis of the western desert." End of quote. Ancient Greek and Roman historians also shed some light on the Apis cult. I've mentioned Strabo, but he wasn't the only one. The famous Greek historian Herodotus also wrote on the Apis worship in the 5th century BC. Diodorus of Sicily, Pliny the Elder and Plutarch all mentioned the cult as well. But not only stele and works by ancient historians shed light on the Serapeum. Researchers found ancient letters, notes on clay shards and even large papyri dealing with the subject. Some of them were found during excavations in Saqqara in the 19th century. One of these is a papyrus from Vienna dating back to the 2nd century BC. Need a recipe for making a bull mummy in 70 days? Read the Vienna Papyrus to learn how. The papyrus contains an amazing level of detail on the mummification process. The bull's body is treated with various oils. His internal organs are extracted and the cavities are filled with little sacks of sodium carbonate and sawdust. The tail, limbs, ears, tongue and horns are treated separately. Special tampons and amulets are placed in the eye cavities. The hooves are cut off and replaced with golden imitations. The mummy is placed in a wooden coffin, which is then dragged to the sacred lake by two priests, where it is placed on a special boat. The boat then sails on the lake, with the priests chanting the sacred texts. This is followed by the opening of the mouth ritual. A large procession carries the apis mummy to the Serapeum, where he will be interred in a subterranean chamber. A part of the text is dedicated to a detailed description of 157 ritual vessels. The papyrus also specifies the garments for the priests to wear during the ceremonies. It is an exhaustive instruction. The Vienna papyrus also describes the embalming workshop in Memphis, where the rituals took place. This part of the apis temple was unearthed in 1941. There, archaeologists found inscriptions mentioning Apis. Most interestingly, the workshop contained eight large alabaster embalming tables, complete with drains. Our good friend, ancient Egypt educator Valery Senmut, visited this place in 2013. We thank him for the photos. We learn from other documents that by the 4th century BC, the Apis cult had reached an unprecedented degree of popularity, with the Serapeum attracting hordes of pilgrims. This might seem irrational to us, a story of a sacred creature, an embodiment of a god on earth, conceived by lightning strike, a healer and a fortune teller, believers worshipping a mummy. Nonsense! But try looking at it from an economical standpoint. The shrines and temples attract pilgrims with money. To serve them, there would need to be hostels, shops and markets selling goods. This leads to flourishing crafts, to crowds of fortune tellers, chanters, dream readers, astrologers, sculptors, cleaners and their families. Archaeologists found amazing documents, a letter archive that belonged to a temple worker named Ptolemy who lived in the 2nd century BC. Among the letters were several petitions to the pharaoh on behalf of some twin sisters. Their mother got involved with a Greek soldier who had murdered the twin's father and she threw the girls out of their home. As luck would have it, the apis bull had just died. The girls were hired to portray the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. The story was dramatized as one of the episodes of the ancient Egyptians' miniseries. The ancient Egyptians worshipped other animals too. One of them was the cult of the cow who gave birth to the apis bull. She was revered as the goddess Isis. The ibis bird was worshipped because the god Thoth was portrayed with the ibis head. The son of Osiris and Isis was the falcon-headed Horus, hence the cult of the falcon. 
At some point in history, a huge necropolis of sacred animals emerges in Saqqara, a half mile away from the Serapeum. Under the shrines there was a maze of catacombs. The complex was excavated by the archaeologists in the second half of the 20th century. Five million ibis mummies were found in the catacombs. Also, 500,000 birds of prey and 500 baboon mummies lay interred there. As if that wasn't enough, researchers found 4,000 statues and 1,000 written documents in ancient Egyptian, Greek, Aramaic and Coptic. A real treasure trove. One of the most amazing finds was a set of temple priests' accessories, braziers, tweezers, incense burners, scepters, crockery and even razors for shaving priest heads. We are especially interested in the necropolis of the sacred cows, the mothers of the apis bulls. In the late 1960s, British Egyptologist Walter Brian Emery and his team were working in the north of Saqqara. Next to the temple ruins, they unearthed numerous cow remains, some of them still wrapped in linen bandages. Apparently, those were mummy parts thrown out of the tombs by grave robbers. Among them was a nearly complete mummy imitation looking similar to apis. The archaeologists also stumbled on bull statuettes, images and inscriptions dedicated to Isis, the mother of Apis. Amory believed that the catacomb burials had to be somewhere nearby. After some search, they did find the necropolis. The Apis mother's catacombs took years to fully uncover and investigate. Tourists usually ignore this place. Alternate historians don't make documentaries about it. We have only dry and boring reports with black and white photographs written by archaeologists. But look at the photos and you will see. These catacombs closely resemble the Serapeum. Just like there, here is a central gallery from which vaulted burial chambers branch out. There are a total of 19 burial chambers there. The place has also yielded numerous inscribed stele and inscriptions on the walls. Sadly, these catacombs have sustained much more damage than the Serapeum. Parts of the ceiling have collapsed. All sarcophagi were smashed to pieces. The robbers were taking all they could lay their hands on. They even dismantled the walls and ripped off the beautiful white cladding, leaving nothing but traces of cement. I remember my homeland, Russia, back in 1993, at the time of economic ruin. There is an unfinished hospital building in one of St. Petersburg residential districts. People would creep onto the construction site through the hole in the fence and open the rip-off cladding and iron reinforcements from the walls to take it home. Good stuff for home repairs. Nothing has changed in 2000 years. Nothing but big slabs of granite remained of the sarcophagi, some of them with canted corners resembling parts of trapezoid sarcophagus lids. In some chambers, archaeologists found cow bones and pieces of gilded wood, amulets and beads that once decorated the mummies. Judging by the special hollows in the floor where the sarcophagi would have been placed, these stone coffins were somewhat smaller than their Serapeum counterparts. A sarcophagus typically weighed 24 tons, with a lid weighing 14 tons. Unlike her son Apis, the mother cow could boast one of three personal names. Tays, Tentbastet or Gerriget. These names are written on the stele found in the catacombs. The stele also lists the works conducted in the catacombs, such as gallery and barrel chamber construction, transportation of the sarcophagi and the barrel of the cows. Some of the stele mention the number of the workers, as well as the amounts of the daily rations, oil and clothing issued to them. For example, the inscription on one stella says that on a certain day in year 5 of King Alexander III, corresponding to May 10, 327 BC, when the living Apis and his mother Thais were at the Memphis temple, the stonemasons had transported the Apis mother sarcophagus to her final resting place. The stella then lists the names of several stonemasons and their parents. It adds that the workers received a daily ration of four baked loaves of bread, five measures of grain, one and a quarter measure of silver, meat and clothing, and an extra one and a quarter measure of silver on the day when they dragged the sarcophagus through the catacombs as a bonus for this complex and responsible operation. Another stealer says that it took the workers 10 days to transport the sarcophagus, for which they had been paid a 30-day ration. We learned from the other two stele that 30 workers had taken part in transporting a sarcophagus. According to the inscriptions in the catacombs, the oldest burial of an apis mother dates back to 393 BC. The last cow was interred in 41 BC, 
during the reign of Cleopatra VII. On average, there was one cow burial per 10 to 20 years. What else do we know about the Isis catacombs? There are special niches for torches in the gallery walls, some of them still with traces of soot visible. The walls still bear traces of the workers' metal chisels. Studying these traces, the archaeologists have learned a lot about catacomb cutting techniques in ancient Egypt. Researchers believe that the catacombs doubled as quarries. Rock was cut out as blocks to be used for temple construction on the surface. Pretty resourceful. Another interesting detail. The same stonemason's names are mentioned on Serapium stele and in the catacombs of the Apis mothers. Apparently, the same individuals worked on both sides. Ancient inscriptions also reveal that not only Apis' mother, but his children were revered in Saqqara as well. Their tombs are yet to be discovered, though. Saqqara still keeps many secrets. We aren't quite done with the Serapium yet. Egyptologists have found numerous inscriptions on stele and other texts at the Saqqara necropolis. From this data, the following picture emerges. The earliest Apis barrels in Saqqara were made during the reign of King Amenhotep III of the 18th dynasty, around 1370 BC. There were no catacombs there at the time. Each bull was buried in his own rock-cut tomb. Mariette found some of these tombs still intact. They passed under the robber's radar thanks to being very well hidden in the rocks. The French archaeologists stumbled on lots of jewelry made of gold and gemstones, as well as statuettes depicting apis and other gods, and ritual vessels. Wooden sarcophagi were found in the tombs, but there wasn't much inside them, only shapeless black tar mixed up with small bone fragments. There was, however, a bull skull in one of the coffins. The skull had fueled pseudoscientific speculations by Swiss author Eric von Däniken about alien monsters buried in these tombs. Archaeologists have a more realistic theory. The priests ate the body of Apis and then buried the remains of the funeral repast. The tradition to fully mummify the bull's remains would only come later. The ritual changed during the reign of Ramses II of the 19th dynasty. In 1235 BC, the earliest underground passages were cut in Saqqara, called the Lesser Vaults. The bulls were now buried in chambers on the sides of the central gallery. They were still interred in wooden coffins at the time. Centuries later, the Lesser Vaults collapsed, most likely during the reign of Semtic I of the 26th dynasty. In 620 BC, a new subterranean complex was constructed, called the Greater Vaults. This is the Serapium we know today. Initially, the bulls were still buried in wooden coffins there, at least three of them. It was only during the reign of King Amasis II in 545 BC that the first granite sarcophagus was used at the Serapium. The last bull was likely interred in a stone sarcophagus during the reign of Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra VII in the 1st century BC. The Apis cult itself had probably endured until the 4th century AD, when Roman Emperor Theodosius had effectively banned all pagan cults, establishing Christianity as the only state religion. Pagans were now being persecuted. It was around that time that the Temple of Serapis in Alexandria was destroyed. The Serapium catacombs were probably plundered by Christian fanatics around that time. They were followed by greedy grave robbers lured by the gold they knew to be readily available in the tombs. The Serapium was gradually being abandoned until it was completely lost under the desert sands. As Mariette was investigating the catacombs, his attention was drawn to a strange detail. There were wall-shaped piles of stones on the lids of many sarcophagi. The ancient Egyptians believed that placing any structure over a grave was a terrible sacrilege. Thus, this may have been how the Christians desecrated the burial complex. Marriott had counted a total of 64 apis burials at the Serapium, of which 24 were inside stone sarcophagi. So, the first stone sarcophagus was made by some King Amensis? What? Sorry, it's a bit of a stretch, really. But the sarcophagus has an inscription on it which says just that.
Oh, come on, the inscription. There are inscriptions even on my garden shed. Don't prove anything. A couple of scrolled lines, my god. Some bare-ass troglodytes scribbled some squiggles with their copper sticks, illegitimately appropriating an object made by a highly developed ancient civilization. You probably meant this sarcophagus. Inscriptions on it look pretty slapdash, for sure. As if made in a hurry. But let's look at another one, made from big granite. The inscription on it was made to the highest ancient Egyptian standards. What does it say? It is a reworked incantation from the pyramid texts, which starts with the words O Apis Osiris, leader of the Western ones, put your garments on and come to me. I am your son Horus. And look, here is the bull Apis himself. We can even make out traces of black paint once used to color the text. The inscription on the lid is even more intriguing. The lid lies at the catacomb entrance, and few visitors pay attention to it. To see the inscription, you have to climb on top of the lid and wipe away the dust. Here is what it says. Horus Semenmat, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Hanami Bra, it is one of the names of King Emesis, has created this monument for the living Apis, a large granite sarcophagus. Now His Majesty has found that nothing of the kind has ever been cut out of precious stone by any king ever before. He has made this for which he is granted eternal life. An official stella dedicated to a bull who died in year 23 of Amasis was also found in the Serapeum. It is now at the Louvre Museum. It bears a similar inscription. Quote, his Majesty, His Piousness, this means Pharaoh, loves what he has done for his father Osiris with the help of Horus, creating a large granite sarcophagus for him. Now His Majesty has found that nothing of the kind has ever been cut out of precious stone by any king ever before. End of quote. So, we've got inscriptions on a sarcophagus and a stela, which confirm that Amasis was the first king to have commissioned a stone sarcophagus for Apis in 545 BC. This agrees with the fact that other stone sarcophagi from the greater vaults date to later kings. You may ask, what if the Egyptians got the sarcophagi from some ancient gods? Okay, how do you prove that? By taking a guess? <laughs> a king could have had his name carved in a sarcophagus to usurp it for himself. But how do you falsify dozens of stelae which describe the construction of the tombs? How do you falsify the inscriptions detailing the amounts of meat and grain paid to the workers who transported the sarcophagi? Alternate historians should probably come up with a more believable theory. Please keep in mind that the sarcophagi were made with fantastic cosmic level precision. There is no way one could have done that manually. Never. Trust my professional experience. I work with these very hands every single day. Oh, damn it. Cut. Cosmic level precision, you say? We've mentioned earlier a researcher named Christopher Dunn, who was filmed wrapping a cord around the notorious core number 7. Here he is holding a high precision marking tool called the square against the edge of a sarcophagus. Visual confirmation! Then I measured the angles of the sarcophagus and they were precisely 90 degrees. I was looking for errors and could not find any. Perfect, totally perfect angles. Their smooth, flat surfaces, orthogonal perfection and incredibly small inside corner radii that I have inspected with modern precision straight edges, squares and radius gauges leave me in awe, writes Don. But for some reason, he does not cite the results of his measurements. 
All he has to say is that the square he used to confirm the great accuracy of the angles was calibrated down to three thousandths of a degree. This, however, is the accuracy of the square, not the angles of the sarcophagus. Let's scrutinize these stone boxes one after another. The sarcophagi are indeed pretty big, and they all differ in shape, material and stonework quality. But what about the precision? At first glance, the surface of the sarcophagi seems pretty smooth, but the angles are far from perfect. If you look closer, you'll see numerous defects and irregularities. These are workmanship defects, because polishing was later done over the irregularities. This is best seen on the rear face. Here is a very large defect, but its surface was polished over, just like any other surfaces, and an image was applied on top. These defects are testimony to technology imperfections. The workers had to use the slab they were given. You can see numerous tiny markings from a stone mallet, where the polishing was bad. There are also areas with no polishing at all. Later sarcophagi are visibly better polished than the earlier ones. This diagram marks the sarcophagi with polished outer surfaces. In the left side section of the galleries, where the Ptolemy era barrels are located, 11 of the 12 are polished, while in the right side, only 2 of the 12. The sarcophagi have a complex shape outside, but inside they boast perfectly straight angles. I'd say they are orthogonal. For reasons unknown, their creators were trying to achieve a perfect internal geometry. We decided to test that by climbing into one of the Serapium sarcophagi dating back to the Ptolemaic period and measuring it inside. Georgi especially bought an electronic square. It might not be as super precise as the one used by Dunn, but it should be good enough to verify the quality of Egyptian stonemason's work. We weren't the first to have made these measurements, but we were probably the first to film them on video. We're gonna get inside now. Georgi Sokolov will do that. We will be shining our torches for him. He'll be using his square to measure the internal angles of the sarcophagus. Let's see if those angles are indeed that accurate. All right, we're going in. It's sarcophagus number 16. We will be using an Elitech electronic square that measures angles from 0 to 360 degrees. First, we'll measure the angles between the walls and the lid. It's 90.8 degrees. Now it's 91.4 degrees. 90.3. Okay, these are the angles between the box and the lid. The lid was moved aside. It may have been skewed, so it's not convincing enough. Let's measure the angles between the walls. 91.3 degrees. 90.9 degrees. Ninety one point four. Ninety point eight. Ninety one point three. We also thought we'd test the quality of the surfaces. According to Dunn, they're perfectly smooth. Checking the lead first. A hundred and eighty point five. A hundred and eighty point six. 180.5 Now the walls 180.4 180.6 Vitali Kraus then also climbed into the sarcophagus and shot the interior on video.
Now we'll measure the external angles. 90 degrees sharp. 89.6 So much for the 1,000th of a degree precision. What we actually see is deviations from the so-called perfectly straight lines by up to 1.4 degrees inside and by up to 0.8 degrees outside. Not bad for a handmade object. Of course, it's very far from those cosmic one-thousandths of a degree. What? There's actually a fact that could potentially save the cosmic theory. Dunn has actually measured another Serapium sarcophagus. That one must surely be cosmically perfect. The only thing I can say is that the Isida team did their own measurements of several Serapium sarcophagi in 2012 and 2013, and their results were similar to ours. But what if we compared the precision of the Serapium angles with those of current Russian granite works? We're not talking here about some unique monuments. We'll measure ordinary granite curbstones and benches. We're now at the Matissev Channel Embankment in St. Petersburg, Russia. Behind me is a new housing development, while under my feet and over there are granite slabs, lined up with granite curbstones. I have no idea as to who put them here, if it was done by humans or by the Atlanteans, or maybe even by aliens. We did not observe the construction process, so we are none the wiser. What we can do, though, is try and measure the accuracy of these granite monoliths. I'm going to use this little gadget here, an electronic square by Elitech, the very one we used to measure the Apis sarcophagi back in Egypt. All right, it's time to measure some angles now. Let's start from this straight angle here. I'm pressing the square neatly, so you could see the display. The digits are upside down, but I'll read them out for you. It's 90.3 degrees. Let's measure another angle now, down along the same curve. I'm pressing the square tightly, so there's no gaps. The accuracy isn't as good here. It's 90.6. Actually, 95.5. Not bad. A short distance from where we were measuring the megalithic curbstones, we found a bridge. The bridge can boast this rather megalithic looking slab, which adjoins the bridge barrier. It's obviously made of granite. We will measure the angles of the slab to see if it too might have been carved by the Anunnaki or the Atlanteans. Let's do it now with my good old square. Let's try it here. Wow, it's unbelievable, my friends. Just look at this. Are my eyes playing tricks on me? Am I dreaming this? It's 90 degrees sharp. A perfect angle. Cosmic precision level. I'm shocked. I just can't help looking at it. But here is another important detail. Over here, you can see this narrow ledge. They made this protruding slab on top. Obviously from solid rock. Let's measure this angle too now. All right, let's do it. Hopefully we'll do it. Okay, I'm pressing the square tightly here. Hang on a sec. There we go. What? This can't be true. I don't believe my eyes. Dear subscribers and viewers, it's a miracle again. 
90 degrees sharp, zero hundreds, zero thousandths of a degree, as confirmed by our electronic square. Hi again, we're still in St. Petersburg, this time in Moskovskaya Square. Here you can see the famous monument to Lenin. We thought we'd measure it first, to make sure it wasn't made by the Anunnaki. But the aliens have played a trick on us. As you can see, it's not straight angled. The angles are definitely not 90 degrees, so we won't measure the monument. But, as luck would have it, there are some benches next to it, supported by granite slabs. We'll measure one of the slabs with my good old square now. Okay, let's do it. I'm pressing it carefully. Wow! Amazing! Incredible accuracy! 90 degrees, oh, with 500... But they may be due to a measuring error. Cosmic level precision, indeed. But we aren't calling it a day yet. Even this trash bin was made with an accuracy that modern measuring tools just can't handle. And this hole was obviously gouged out by a gigantic drill made from an unknown material. Could have been made with a laser or even a plasma cutter, who knows? Of course, even if it's less than cosmically precise, crafting a sarcophagus is hard and complex labor. Complex, you say? You can't replicate this even with modern equipment! Well, if Christopher Dunn were to be believed, quote, Later Christopher Dunn got in touch with the biggest companies specializing in high-accuracy stoneworking. No company said they could make a similar sarcophagus with the tools available today. I do not have a list of companies Christopher Dunn talked to. We turned to a Russian company instead, called Torgovy Dom Vazrozhdenia. They specialize in natural stonework. We asked them if they could fashion a granite box, the size of a Serapium sarcophagus, with a polished surface. This was the company manager's reply. Quote, this would be a special order. Theoretically, it could be made, but it would be 80% manual processing using a diamond power tool. The estimated cost would be around 198.5 to 225,000 US dollars, with three to six months working time. End of quote. The manager said the time depended on how long they'd take to find a granite slab. Dear friends, if you really wish to see the making of a sarcophagus, or if you are a pharaoh, all you have to do is donate 225,000 bucks. <laughs> Looks like another loud claim by Dunn has turned out to be a fake. And it's not the last one of his claims. In another documentary, Mr. Dunn says, You know what they were supposed to be using for those boxes? They were burying the Apis bull, which was a revered animal, okay? The Apis bull's lifespan is supposed to be 28 years. Time studies on how fast they can remove granite using the ancient Egyptian tools, mm -hmm. okay? Now, you use the material removal rate of the old methods and the multiply that out down, huh? by the time, you know, using the maximum number of workers that you can actually get in the work at the work site. And you're not talking 28 years, you're talking 50 plus years. And how late is too late? I give you only three months. The time is running. However, Dunn does not provide any facts to back up his claim. I'll be honest with you. We haven't conducted an experiment to craft a giant granite sarcophagus, but we did do some experimenting of our own. For example, we crushed granite with a dolerite hammer, reaching the rate of a little over 5 cubic centimeters a minute. Let's calculate. 
Four workers will take less than two years to carve the interior of a granite sarcophagus. If you don't believe me, you can do your own math. We'll link up the calculations in the description to this video. It's hard to figure out the amount of time it could take to fashion the outer surface, as this would depend on the shape and size of the slab. The Egyptians probably chose a slab of the right size and then worked it by crushing. Let's assume the exterior would take another two years to complete and let's add one year for the polishing job, carving the reliefs and other cosmetic work. It's safe to assume that the interior and exterior of a sarcophagus would probably have been worked simultaneously, but let's sum up the total time. We get five years, not fifty. But is this too long? An apis bull would live around 10 to 15, sometimes even up to 25 years. If work on the sarcophagus commenced the moment apis had ascended to the throne, then a complete sarcophagus would have been ready in the burial chamber by the moment the bull died. Some people still like to point at the three angle inner corners worked with fantastic precision. Quote, researchers came to a conclusion that three angle corners inside the sarcophagi could not have been carved with the primitive tools that, as we like to think, were typical for ancient stonemasons. End of quote. Well, I should disappoint them. Russian experimenter Olga Vdovina has fashioned a three angle corner using nothing but a set of primitive stone tools. She took about 40 hours to complete the job. So, what do you want to prove by this? It's just a rough and lopsided corner. The surface is caving in. The plane is offset. What about the mirror polishing? What about diagonals leveling up to a micron? This hammering away with a little piece of rock is nothing but a cheap and bland parody. Let's examine the inner corners of the actual Serapium sarcophagi and compare that to August's result. Can you see any difference at all? A lot of people wonder how the sarcophagi were transported. Apparently, they were shipped down the Nile from the quarries first and then dragged to the catacombs. But how were these massive objects handled inside the narrow subterranean corridors? Well, the corridors are not that narrow, actually. They are wide enough for a sarcophagus to fit inside. This is proven by one of the sarcophagi abandoned in the corridor. Okay, but how many workers were needed to haul a hundred-ton monster? According to Dunn, each box with a lid weighs about 100 tons. A small correction, not 100 tons. The weight of a Serapium sarcophagus is between 27 and 45 tons, with the lid adding another 17 to 25 tons. This doesn't add up to 100 tons. We can safely assume that the sarcophagus and its lid were manhandled separately. Let's look at the largest one weighing 45 tons. 50,000 kilograms. So, let's say strong ancient Egyptians were, were really strong and each but each person will drag 200 kilos <laughs> okay so that's good that's so also to be functional hmm? so that means uh, five for each time okay. and five times 50 250. so 250 250 where you gonna fit them just imagine 250 poor Egyptian powerlifters stuck together in a narrow corridor. Uh. 
The gentleman in this video may be good at math, but he probably isn't much of a physics fan. The thing is, there was no need to lift the sarcophagus. It could be moved horizontally instead. When you need to move a fridge around your kitchen, you probably won't be able to lift it. But you can easily move it even with one hand, as it resists on a set of rollers, and rolling friction is less than sliding friction. The ancient Egyptians knew that very well. Let's assume we have to move a 45-ton sarcophagus placed on a wooden sled, which is being rolled by workers over 15 wooden logs, each 20 centimeters in diameter. You will have to apply a force of 700 kilograms in order to overcome the resistance. This is an ideal scenario. Of course, the logs might not be perfectly round and the floor could be bumpy. Let's make it not 700 kilos, but 2 tons. With a couple of ropes thrown over the beam, the sarcophagus can be moved by workers positioned behind it, pulling ropes towards themselves. The ropes go through the pulleys attached to the sarcophagus. The laws of physics dictate that a movable pulley can decrease the load twice, ignoring the friction. If each worker pulling the rope generates a force of 30 kilos, 50 workers will generate a force of 2.5 tons. We thus get the force enough and to spare. Mind you, we're talking 50 ordinary guys, not 50 power lifters. I don't think that positioning all of them inside the catacombs would be more difficult than actually setting the sarcophagus in motion. This can be done by pushing the load with the levers. One of the sarcophagi belonging to an apis mother weighs 25 tons, so 30 workers will be sufficient to move it. And 30 workers are mentioned on ancient stele. We've described a scenario of the workers pulling the ropes. But what if they have the luxury of a winch? I don't mention this as some sort of fantasy here. Mariette wrote that he found two winches inside one of the Serapim's burial chambers. Each winch was made of hardwood sycamore and had eight handles. Let's assume that the length of a winch handle is 1.2 meters, the axle radius is 10 centimeters. Each winch is operated by two workers, and each worker generates a force of 20 kilograms. Then the force generated by the winch will be 2,240 kilograms. If we use a movable beam, the force will increase significantly. A single winch operated by 16 workers will easily do the job of moving a sarcophagus. You might think that the locks will get crushed by the immense weight. Let's do some more math then. 15 logs for a mass of 45 tons, 3 tons per log. If a log is 2.5 meters long, then we get the pressure of a little over 1 ton per 1 meter of the log length. A hard type of wood will bear that easily. You don't believe me? All right, then cut a 10 centimeter long piece of log and get a person who weighs 100 kilograms to jump on it. A few more mysteries remain. The sarcophagus had to be rotated and dragged inside the burial chamber. This diagram shows how it could have been done. When the sarcophagus was at the level of the chamber floor, the ropes were thrown over the beam and then into the corridor over two vertical poles. The sarcophagus would then turn an inch into the chamber. The workers pulling the ropes were positioned in the corridor. However, we've got another problem here. The sarcophagi are placed in special recesses. The chamber floor is 1.5 meters lower than the corridor floor, so the sarcophagus must be lowered into the recess. How did they do that? Mariette also tried to figure that out. 160 years ago, he came up with a simple and elegant solution. The chamber would be covered with sand up to the floor level, so that once inside, the sarcophagus would be at the same level as the corridor. Then the workers would shovel the sand out of the chamber, thus slowly lowering the sarcophagus onto the floor. Special trenches would have been made ahead of that operation to fully lower the sarcophagus. The workers positioned in special niches on the sides used the trenches to shovel the sand from underneath the sarcophagus. And it's not just guesswork. Mariette writes in his book that he had found one of the sarcophagi resting on a layer of sand, just a few inches below the corridor level. The sarcophagus was filled with stones, so its weight must have been pretty staggering. Mariette positioned four workers in the niches on the sides of the sarcophagus and told them to shovel away the sand. With no great effort, they managed to lower the sarcophagus onto the chamber floor. Just think, Mariette was a 19th century scientist who knew nothing about electric tools or heavy-duty trucks. And he firmly believed that the Serapium sarcophagi had been manually created by the ancient Egyptians. Why are we trying to bring in some aliens then? Maybe it's because we forgot how to use our hands and brain. Well, who do you think built the pyramids?
I don't have any idea who built them. This is backbreaking work, working your guts out with no social security package. Who in their right mind would have agreed to work for that bloody pharaoh? Not me, that's for sure. By the way, the sarcophagi being placed below the level of the central gallery is a big plus. You didn't have to lift the lid to put it on top of the sarcophagus, as the lid rested on the sarcophagus right at the gallery floor level. Okay, but how did the grave robbers fish out the burial goods from inside the sarcophagi? How did they manage to lift the massive lids? Archaeologists investigating the Apis mother's tombs seem to have stumbled on the answer. They found beam holes under the ceiling of many of the chambers. Similar ones have been found in some of the Serapine chambers too. Archaeologists believe that the robbers threw ropes over those beams and then slightly nudged the lid up. The lid had to be lifted just a little bit to let a smallish person crawl inside the sarcophagus. Most lids in the Serapium were moved just a little bit, just like that. There's a few exceptions. This sarcophagus was simply cracked open. Some writers say that Mariette was so impatient that he used dynamite to open up that sarcophagus. Von Däniken writes that the French Egyptologist used dynamite during his excavations. But dynamite was only invented in 1867, years after Mariette had dug up the Serapium. In his book, Mariette never mentions using an explosive to open up the sarcophagi. It would have been highly irregular, as the contents of the sarcophagi were real scientific treasures that could be easily destroyed with an explosion. There was also the danger of the ceiling caving in. Mariette points out himself that all sarcophagi in the greater vaults had been opened up before him. Over the centuries, numerous tomb robbers had penetrated the Serapium. The methods they used to open up the sarcophagi could have been very different from each other. For example, we can see obvious traces of wedges on the Amasis sarcophagus that had been hammered under the lid. So why does our sarcophagus have this big gaping hole in it? The robbers had probably decided to break inside the stone box by smashing its front side with stone or metal tools. Given all that, it's no wonder that no mummies had been preserved inside the stone sarcophagi. Even if some were found in the 19th century, they were of little interest to the archaeologists of the time. Some of the animal remains we do have, though, such as this big mummy head from the Serapium, now on display in the Louvre. Judging by the light triangular mark on his forehead, it was the Apis bull himself. Okay, time to draw some conclusions. We've got inscriptions on stele and on the walls of the Serapium, as well as in the Apis Mother's catacombs. We've got inscriptions on the actual sarcophagi, and we have evidence of ancient historians and text on papyri. All of it proves that the Serapium was not an ancient power plant or a zero-dimensional space, but merely a cemetery of sacred bulls in use from the 6th to the 1st century BC. Manufacturing and transporting a sarcophagus was difficult and expensive. However, it is doable by modern stoneworking companies and was doable by ancient stonemasons too. The workmanship quality of the Serapium sarcophagi is good enough for manual work. However, we must rule out any cosmic level quality as there are obvious traces of manual tooling on the sarcophagi. The laws of PR dictate that people tend to believe crafty amateurs with measuring tools than scientists who may have spent years digging up ancient monuments in horrible conditions. Books by August Mariette and other Serapium experts are no easy read and hard to find, while YouTube videos are there for all to see. I believe we should follow the example of August Mariette, the discoverer of the Serapium, who bravely dug to the sands and rock through other people's ignorance and greed, with no internet, no hot water, and no decent medicine to make his outstanding discovery. Of course, questions still remain. I'm still trying to dig up more info on that bull mummy had from the Louvre, and we have no idea what happened to the winches found by Mariette in the Serapium. I'd love to try to move a 50-ton load manually using the technique I have described in this video. The pandemic has sadly come in the way, but I still hope to do this experiment one day. Would you like to give a hand? My amateurish calculations may not be 100% accurate, so I'll be thankful for any constructive feedback. I'm Alexander Sokolov. See you next time.
This video was partly filmed at the field camp of the Institute of the History of Material Culture of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Hotelovo. I thank Alexander Ocheredny and the whole archaeologist team for helping me set up the shoot. Alexander Sokolov reporting from Egypt, Antropogenes Science Video Lab and Science Station. Найденных археологами в Серапевме превысило тысячу. Тысячу. Древние египтяне поклонялись священному быку Апису. Так, комар, ты куда лезешь? Сволочь. В дальнейшем число стел, найденных археологами в Серапевме, превысило. Я не могу что-то не смешно стало. Простите. У меня нет списка всех компаний, с которыми связывался. Кто там скрипит стулом, блин? Хватит. Так.